is, if, for those who don't know, is, is really the, the lifeblood of our program. She's our, our Parkinson's, our movement disorder nurse. She's the personal concierge for our patients that, you know, she's available 24 seven and pretty much knows every answer to every question you may have. Um, so what we'll do is kind of give a little overview and then um, work through um, questions and answers. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll feel a little more comfortable with this and feel like you're a little smarter about deep brain stimulation. Speaking of smarter, I'm gonna to try to sh share my screen. So if it screws up, just don't judge me. <laughs> Okay, I think everybody can see that, um, correct? Correct. Okay, good, excellent. So um, deep brain stimulation um, is a technology that we'll talk a little bit about, but it has its roots in um, the late 1980s in France. Um, Dr. Benabide in Grenoble, France pioneered deep brain stimulation and Basically, before that, in neurosurgery, we would do what's called lesioning. So if we found something in the brain that we wanted to um, not be there anymore, like say a tumor, we would go in and put an electrode in it, turn up an electrical current and kind of sort of boil it a little bit, just like you would put an egg in a microwave and, and it congeals. And, and that's kind of what we did before. The thing about lesioning was you were doing it, whatever you did was a permanent thing and it was static. So um, you'd have an effect, but it wouldn't evolve over time and you couldn't adjust it. And what Dr. Benabid thought was, well, <clears throat> you know, if I put an electrode in there, but instead of making a lesion, if I just turn up the electricity, will that have the same effect, but give me the ability to adjust it over time, to modulate it. And so he tried that out. And in fact, it was very effective. And, and the great thing about being able to adjust the way you're um, changing the, the brain activity over time um, is the fact that as a disease progresses, you can um, adapt what you're doing. So it's not a static kind of thing. So like the example I used before for a tumor, a tumor is something you just want to kind of kill it all. So that, that was a good use for lesioning. But diseases that are progressive, like um, movement disorders, um, that, that is something where, you know, you might at one point in time need a certain sort of amount of electrical activity adjusted, but then over time it may change. And that's where what Dr. Benaby did, he discovered that you could just use the electricity, not make any permanent lesion, which made this reversible and adjustable over time. So for the most part, uh, when you put an electrode in for deep brain stimulation, you're not making a lesion. So if you put it in and for some reason, something better comes along down the road, say stem cell transplant or something, you can take it out and do something different without having burned any bridges because you're not making any lesions. It's just sort of modifying um, in the brain, the activity and, and, the, and what happens in the brain, why, why Parkinson's disease, why a lot of neurologic disorders happen is a um, sort of a, a lo loss of synchronization of the circuits in the brain. So there's, there's six major sets of circuits in the brain that are electrical connections. And you can kind of think of them, think of them as um, train routes where maybe a train goes from here to Harrisburg to um, Morgantown back to here. And each of those sites, Harrisburg, Morgantown, Pittsburgh, they're kind of relay centers where you can get on another train or connect with something else. And what happens is those relay centers connect with the other circuits and balance things out. And whenever one circuit is going faster than the other, just like a train, if the train's off its cycle, it gets to the station before the next train gets there. And then you're just missing the train all the time. So in the brain, 
what happens is um, those circuits, when they get asynchronous, when they're not in the right rhythm, it leads to different things. And, and some of the circuits lead to psychiatric disorders when they get, get disrupted. Some lead to motor disorders. So, um, so in Parkinson's, um, it's a case of one of those relay stations, the subthalamic nucleus in the brain, is getting less activity, which then slows down the ability to loosen your muscles and then lets the ability for your muscles to stay more rigid overtake that. So the smoothness of your muscles, the antagonistic and the agonistic, like your biceps and your triceps working together where one releases and then the other one activates and vice versa, how you bend your elbow. That if, if for some reason your biceps stayed in spasm and your triceps never got tight, you would never be able to extend your arm. So that's, that's how circuits work in the brain. There's the, the, the push and the pull, the, the, the good and the bad, the, the sort of circuitry. And whenever that gets disrupted, that's what leads to disorders like movement disorders. Um, and so bringing those two concepts together, the ability to get in and change the electrical activity to try to get it back in synchrony, and then also finding the right relay station to put that electrode in to affect the right circuit is really what deep brain stimulation is. And, and that's why it's so revolutionary prior to 1990, because it gave the ability to adjust things over time. And, um, and it's really taken off over time. Um, over well, now about a quarter of a million people, over a quarter of a million people worldwide have had deep brain stimulator surgery successfully. And, um, and it's really becoming more and more an early option, more of a standard of care. When it first was introduced, when we started it in the US in 1991, it was experimental and really at the end of the line, once you were bedridden and you had no other options. But, um, but we're finding now is that a lot of times, the earlier we get involved, the less downstream effects that can be permanent can occur. So the, le the less permanent muscular rigidity or the less uh, deconditioning and things like that. It's also really one of the few things that we do in neurosurgery that has what's called level one evidence, which means that it's been tested in a random way, randomized fashion, where some people get it and some people don't. In both cases, you get it, but some people have it on and some people don't. And then they follow them over time. It's the highest level of evidence to prove that it's effective. And there's very few things in neurosurgery to have this level of evidence to suggest that it's very effective at taking care of the problem. Um, in the case of um, Parkinson's disease, um, it's, a, it's a very good indication. And again, the target in the brain is a part of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus, which is one of the circuits in the motor pathway. There's several other circuits that we would put the electrode in for other movement disorders. For example, essential tremor, the target would be in the thalamus, the, what's called the ventro-intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. And for dystonia, the globus pallidus, which is a different part of the brain, is the target for um, stimulation there because they're in different parts of that same relay circuit that affect motor function in a different way. So it's different stations along that train station where there's different activities depending on which disease we're talking about. But for Parkinson's disease, um, the stimulator works very similarly to L-DOPA. So in fact, one of the tests that we do to screen if you're a good candidate for stimulator surgery is called a dopamine challenge test where we have you off of your medications when you come in and we do testing. And then we have you on your medications and we do testing again. We wanna see a certain percentage of improvement to suggest that stimulation would also be beneficial. If we do that testing and we don't see any improvement in motor function, 
then stimulation probably wouldn't be a good thing to consider. It's also good when there's uh, motor fluctuations, when there's rapid wearing off. So you take the medication dose and it doesn't last nearly as long as it did before and you're taking it multiple times in a day. For us, if you're taking it three or more times a day, then, then we at least talk about uh, the options. Um, and again, uh, with, with, for us, when, when you come to see us for a visit, we're not bringing you in to put you to sleep to have surgery or something like that. We just talk about it, what the options are, give you the pros and cons, give you information, and then sort of let you follow up when you think it's time um, to consider that if you choose to consider that. Another indication where um, deep brain stimulation is very good is when there's dyskinesias. Dyskinesias often are, are from the medication itself. And because with the stimulation, that takes the benefit, that gives the benefit that the medications would, we can decrease the medications over time. And because dyskinesias are a side effect of the medications, by decreasing the medications, we therefore can, can improve or, or get rid of the dyskinesias. So that's an effect of decreasing the medications, which is made possible because the stimulation is giving the benefit the medications had been doing. Tremor, uh, bradykinesia, and rigidity are also very good, very responsive indications for deep brain stimulation. They work very well for that. A couple of things that, that stimulation isn't very helpful for is postural instability. So you're having a lot of balance problems or instability problems, deep brain stimulation is not very helpful. Also, uh, memory problems and things, things related to memory um, are not well treated with the stimulation. And, and in fact, aside from the dopamine test that we do to see if you're a candidate for the surgery, if you want to consider that, we also do um, memory testing to assess the level of memory function because we have certain criteria where if um, there's so much disruption of memory, you may well not be a candidate for the stimulation. And, and typically that's further along in the course of the disease. And, and what we've learned over time is that we don't, if, if, if you're a candidate from a motor function standpoint, we wanna get you sooner rather than later because there's sort of a, a curve where at a certain point, you start to get less and less benefit from, this, from the stimulation because you're too far along in the course of the disease. For the most part, we can always get some benefit, but the question is how much is gonna get you back to your lifestyle, which is really why you're doing it. You wanna have improvement of function, but also try to get back to the lifestyle that you were accustomed to. And, I think an important thing to know is that there is no cure, um, but this is a really good way to treat the symptoms. The, the disease will continue to be progressive. There are some studies in the literature that suggest that deep brain stimulation may slow the progression of the disease, but that's not been de definitively proven. But, but what I can tell you is, like we talked about a couple of minutes ago, when you do have the stimulator in, if the disease progresses, we can adjust the stimulator and set different electrical settings, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, to recapture symptom control with each of those, uh, with each of those generators. So you can see on the picture here, there's the two electrodes in yellow in the brain. Then under, outside of the skull, there's little wires under the skin that travel down past the neck to by the collarbone. And then there's two battery packs or sometimes one battery pack, depending on how we do it, um, that has a little microcomputer in it. And that computer has over 64,000 different settings that we can set just by putting a little wand over your shirt over that area and re reprogramming the computer. And what those settings do is they change the shape of the electricity and the strength of the electricity in that part of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus. And by changing that electricity, that down regulates that nucleus by an incremental more amount, the higher the settings. So it's similar to say, 
you know, the thermostat on your um, furnace. If you want it to be 70 degrees, you set it at 70 degrees and it adjusts the temperature to get to 70 degrees. Or if you want it to be 68 degrees, you set a different setting. In this situation, we adjust the generator just like you would adjust your thermostat, but instead of it auto-regulating by just sensing your motor function and automatically adjusting, we, we examine your function, your rigidity, your tremor, your stiffness, your other symptoms, and adjust it to, to your examination. So, so we can adapt it just like you would the thermostat in your furnace to treat the symptoms to the point where we're maximally getting benefit by adjusting the different settings. So the good thing about the stimulator, the really good thing is, like I said, it's adjustable and it's reversible. <clears throat> so once you have, have it in, as the disease progresses, we can usually recapture symptom control, even if you develop new and progressive symptoms so that for you, it may seem years and years before the disease progresses at all. Um, but if we were to turn it off, you would see a huge difference. But the, but the good thing about that is that it can keep it under control. So that, that's the basics of that. Um, who are the best candidates for this? Like I said, we've been finding over time that the younger the people are to get it, not you know, eight, you know, necessarily 18 or something like that, but the earlier in their life, they get it, the more benefit they seem to have because it keeps people at peak function longer, number one. Number two, as I said, there may be some protective benefit from progression, although that's not scientifically proven. Um, but, it, but it really does keep you functioning at your peak performance because once you lose ground, sometimes it's harder to get back. It's easier to, easier to maintain where you are when we put it in, but it's harder to turn the clock back as far as function. Um, so that's, that's why we've moved to an earlier stage. Um, and like I said, typically, if you're taking medicines three or more times a day, we at least want to start the conversation um, for some time in the future. Um, we also, um, people who have a really good response to medications, particularly those who have a really good response, but are also very sensitive because of side effects at low doses. They're great people for, um, great candidates for the surgery. People, like I said, who have dyskinesias and motor fluctuations are also very good candidates for the surgery because we can decrease the medications virtually all the time. And that, that improves both of those symptoms just by decreasing the medications. But you can decrease the medications because the stimulation is doing the benefit for you instead of the medications. I think, um, well, obviously, tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia um, are very, um, very responsive to this. As I mentioned before, it's not a cure, but it's very good at treating the symptoms. One thing that I didn't mention that's real important is um, unlike medications, which you know wear off over time and you have to remedicate and continue that cycle, the electrical benefit stays steady. 24 hours a day, day over day, year over year. So, so there's no sort of habituation or needing more and more electricity for the same amount of benefit. It stays steady all the time. It, it pretty much does um, what the brain would do normally as far as electrical activity. So it doesn't have that pharmacologic effect of wearing off or side effects. Um, there, there, um, so, so, that, so that essentially what that means is when you go to bed, you wake up with the same amount of um, fluidity of motion and improvement of symptoms, whereas with medications, a lot of times you have to redose and get moving and wait for it to kick in. So that's another really good benefit of the stimulation. Um, so for us, you know, aside from those symptoms that I mentioned, we always check an MRI um, in addition to the psych psychological memory testing and in addition to the dopamine testing. Those are the three things we do to make sure that there's no contraindication, no reason we wouldn't, wouldn't want to put electrodes into the brain. 
Um, the on-off testing is the dopamine testing, and we like to see a 25% improvement. And the neuropsychological testing is the memory testing. And there's certain scores that we have a cutoff on where it's just sometimes the risk outweighs the benefit. Um, and that's, that's a little bit variable, but those are the main criteria. As I mentioned, um, the hardware involved, there's um, two leads, usually one on each side. We seldom do this on one side only because it's a bilateral total body disease. So if we only do one side, not only do you only get partial benefit because you're only doing one side, you only get partial benefit on that side as well because there's about 20% of the brain fibers that cross over. So if you're only doing one side, you're missing 20% of that side's function and improvement. And, um, and you're not doing anything on the other side. So we usually do bilateral. So it's usually two electrodes. They're only about a millimeter and a half in diameter. So you can check your measuring tape and see how big that is, but it's really very small. And it just slides through into the area where we want to put it. And we use a very complex um, computer navigation system in the operating room that's it's similar to your GPS, but way more um, sophisticated. And, and it, use, it uses computer calculations to get us within one millimeter of accuracy where we want to go. So within the brain, the subthalamic nucleus, for example, is only about eight millimeters tall and about five millimeters in diameter. And the electrode is about a millimeter and a half in diameter. So when we put that electrode in, widthwise it fills it up. And then lengthwise, there's usually between four and eight individual contacts on the electrode. And you can see on that picture, there's four on each side there, the little dark gray within the yellow. And basically what that what they do is they, um, in this area, each one of those fills that subthalamic nucleus. So we pretty much take control of that part of the brain top to bottom, and that's how we can and control all of that. So those are the parts in the brain. Then there's a um, small plastic extension that we tunnel under the skin, and then there's a generator. And for generators that are voltage based uh, and battery power, they usually last between one and five years, depending on how much electrical activity, how much power you need to control the symptoms. But for the rechargeable ones, which is mostly what we're doing these days, a lot of times both electrodes go into just one generator and it lasts 15 years. So it's really one of those procedures where you get it done and then for at least 15 years, we can keep adjusting it to control symptoms, which is way better than go to the pharmacy every month. So it's sort of a lot easier to adjust. And the rechargeable, you just recharge it about once a week just by putting a little, it's not like charging your car or anything like that. It's just, you put a little um, sort of soft pad over that area and sit watching TV for about a half an hour or so. And then it gets under control and it gets charged back up. Then you're good for another week or two. Um, how does it really work when we put the electricity in there? Nobody really knows. There's a whole lot of fancy physics calculations and current calculations and things like that. But the bottom line is um, what it essentially does is the subthalamic nucleus is just too active. It's hyperactive and the electricity just turns off portions of it incrementally. So stay at a, a voltage of, of one volt you're turning off 20% of it and that gets you the symptoms you want. But say it's three or four years down the road and symptoms have progressed. Now you wanna maybe turn off 30 or 40% of it. You turn up the electricity and change some of the other settings to do that and then recapture symptom control. So nobody knows exactly whether it's working on the neurons, which is the cells of the brain or whether it's working on the axons, which are the connections from those cells to the next cell. Um, nobody really has been able to figure that quite out yet. So it's unknown how it works, but it really works, which is the cool thing that really matters.
Um, and as I said, the programming, programming really um, is the key to it. So the stimulator, you know, when you get a, when you make the choice to, to get a stimulator, it's like making the choice to buy a guitar. You know, you can get it, but unless you know how to play it, it doesn't do you much good. So that's where the programming really matters. Uh, programming typically takes between three and six months to get you to just the right settings because um, when we're putting it, the brain, it sounds self-evident, but the brain is really pretty smart. So when we try to change what the brain's doing, it's gonna to adapt to that. So as we set electrical settings, you'll get some improvement, but then the brain will figure that out and kind of work around it a little bit and you'll lose some of that improvement. And then we need to work it back up and work it back up until we get the brain adjusted to what we're doing with the electricity. And then it kind of stays in a steady state. Um, like I said, there's, there's over 65,000 different settings um, and it really is easy to adjust just by putting that, the little, there's a little connection to that program that just goes right over your shirt and we make the adjustments. So, you know, does it really, is it really worth it? Do people think it matters? And, and uh, there's been a bunch of studies that look at this and continue to look at this, but what's been found is that even two years after the surgery, Two years after the surgery, well beyond the initial benefit and the excitement of all of that, but you're back into your life, 62% of people still um, say they've had a marked improvement in their quality of life, which is an overall, overall calculation of a lot of different functions, but improvement of quality of life in 62% of people. 68% uh, of um, improvement in the quality of life of the caregivers after, after two years. So they've noticed that, that people are in, more independent and, and can take more care of themselves and lead, need less from the caregivers. People do um, a lot of times experience some weight gain. It's variable how much, but a lot of times that's either from decrease in energy consumption from the rigidity and tremors, or sometimes just because it's easier to eat and, and, um, and um, feed yourself. But that also, that's that part of this, the overall picture we take care of with you is not only do we put it in, but we kind of get into some therapy programs. And then, and then you know, again, working with, with um, in the Parkinson's Foundation to get other ways to stay active and, you know, take advantage of the improvement in the motor function by increasing your activity, increasing your flexibility, and then weight gain is less of a, an issue. Sleep also is improved because you can sleep through the night because the Electrical activity stays steady through the night, whereas medications wear off and, and the rigidity and other symptoms recur. Um, also, there's been uh, improvement in pain reported by many people um, after that as well because of decreased rigidity and, and things like that. So just that's kind of much longer than I kind of wanted to go into, but I hope that was helpful. Um, I think just in summary, it's very safe. There's less than one half of 1% chance of anything really bad happening, like bleeding, stroke, coma, or death, or anything like that. Less than one half of 1%. Then there's only about a 3% chance of anything more minor happening, like infection, or reaction to man anesthesia, or reaction to medicines, or anything like that. So the risks are small, and about 99.5% of the time, we get some degree of improvement with the stimulation over what you were getting with the medicines. Now, how much is different? About 95% of the time, we make a huge difference in people's lifestyle where they, they, there's a noticeable improvement in functionality. And, and usually about half the time, we can get you either way down or off the medications and virtually always we can decrease the medications. So those are things that are that are pretty consistent. Um, there's still, you know, a fear that it's brain surgery, but again, like I said, the risks are small, and and we, you really only do it if your lifestyle is limited by what you're doing. So it's not like, it's not like you're doing it for no reason. So usually the 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 benefits far far outweigh the risks of the surgery, and and again, it's minimally invasive. So it is one of those surgeries where you're 
And for the brain surgery, and you're actually awake for that most of the time, unless you don't want to be, because it helps us find just the right location. And it's not uncomfortable for the most part. Um, and then you stay overnight. And then the, the part a week later, we do it in two parts. A week later, we bring you back, put you to sleep to connect it all up with the extension and the generator. And then you go home the same day. So it's really uh, minimally invasive and short hospital stay, but maximally effective. And, and you know, as David said earlier, we, we've done a few. I think we're over a thousand patients at this point over the last 20 years. So it, it's um, it's a very effective option. So I'm going to stop there. Cindy and I are available for questions for anything after that that you'd like to discuss. If you want to click on the Q&A box, you'll be able to see all the questions that have uh, been entered so far. OK. So uh, should I just go through them? Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you're able, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I'm, I am very capable. I just didn't want to take away <laughs> from anything you guys wanted to do. No, no, go uh, for it. So first question is, will I be awake for the first surgery? Um, yes. Well. It's a choice and Cindy can chime in on that because the way that usually works is um, we uh, bring in the operating room and, and you're awake on the table and Cindy's on the side that your, your face is on and, and your head's covered and we're on the other side. So you're talking to her and usually she's talking to you about her kids or trips or your kids or something like that. But you're awake um, and it's really, other than uh, putting the numbing medicine into the skin, it's no, there's no pain with that. There's a little vibration with just making the opening in the bone. But while you're talking, we're doing the work and putting the electrode in. And then when you're awake, we can turn the electricity on and see the benefit we're getting at the voltage setting we're setting it at. Because if we move it a millimeter one way or another, a lot of times that can take help need less voltage, which then gives you better symptom control over time. So it's more just for fine tuning the location. It's not mandatory, but it's helpful. So that is that question. Um, Cindy, do you wanna add anything to that? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, it helps me too when I go to programs so I know what side effects she gets when we're testing. Okay. Sorry, okay. Is anything else? Cindy? Yes. No, I just, I like to be there so I know what symptoms, what side effects we get, and it helps me program when I do okay. the programming. Okay, next question. Um, someone had a cardiac arrest in 2019 with hypoxic brain injury that mimics Parkinson's. Uh, could this help that person? Um, that is not likely because um, when there's the, the key thing for the stimulator to work is that the electrical circuit pathways are intact, but firing sort of in an irregular way. If there's been brain injury where the circuits have been disrupted uh, from stroke or something like that, then there's no circuit to get involved in. So typically we, that is not helpful for that. So if the CAT scan or MRI shows any stroke-like activity, that's not helpful. If there's not, then it, it'd be worth an evaluation just to to check it out, but but it's not very likely. Hope that helps. Um, next question. How long would you be off medication to see if you are a candidate? Cindy can answer that one. Yes, um, so you would stop your medication usually around dinner time the day before. You would come in in the morning, I would do the test. It doesn't take long, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Take your medicine. Let you um, wait till it kicks in. I'd repeat the same test, but you're probably there about two hours total that day. Does that help? 
So yeah, so you're off the night before or the morning of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then here's one. Is this picture to scale? Are the generators really that big? Um, so that is the original drawing from 1991. They used to be much larger. The technology now is smaller and smaller. It's not, it's not to the size of a quarter yet, but it's, um, it's about half the size of what that picture is now. They're, they're less deep and they're less tall. So no, they're not that big. <laughs> Um, next question, um, can you speak to the timeline after surgery, how much time it takes to optimize technology and how variable it can be for each individual? Which is a really good question because it is very individualistic. When, when people ask, you know, how, how, how much is it gonna improve my symptoms after surgery? Everybody's their own barometer for that. Um, there's, um, and, every, and how long it takes to get to optimal symptom control is, is different for everybody. Um, it's different by symptom, and it's different by severity of symptoms, and it's also different by how the disease is progressing. So, um, so everybody's different. And, and like I said, the initial programming is usually three to six months, probably visiting, you know, every two to four weeks during that time and getting adjustments. But, um, and, and sometimes as the disease progresses, it, it's, it gets to where, um, you know, the, you, you, get, you can get improvement, but you don't get the, all the improvement that you'd like to see sometimes because the disease has progressed to the point where it, it is improving it, but not, not as much as you'd like. So it is, it is highly variable. Um, but again, the earlier we get involved, a lot of times the better. Cindy, do you want anything to add about programming? Um, and it all depends on the symptoms. We have to work with neurology too to decrease your meds. Dyskinesias are usually a limiting factor on how high we can go with the first time until we talk to your neurologist. Okay. Um, I hope that answers that because that's a complex question because it's very, it is very individualistic. Um, next one, my mom seems like a candidate based on your slide. What would be the next step? She's a patient of one of the doctors and takes medicines four times a day. Um, I think, you know, particularly with Dr. Licklider, who's the doctor you were saying, he, um, I think what you'd say is just to him, you'd like to at least hear about deep brain stimulator surgery. And then he would send you over, we'd talk about it. And then you could decide how you'd want to proceed, whether sticking with medicines or hearing more about the surgery after that. But like I said, when you come to see us, it's more of just um, for an opinion. It's not like that you're coming just because you're, you're coming because you want to have the surgery. We like to have the discussion with you and let you make your own mind up. Um, Hopefully answer that. Have you had any patients recover their sense of smell? That's a really, really good question. Um, Cindy, you can answer it. No, not really. And that's, that's exactly the answer. No, not really. <laughs> it's, it's a hard one. That's such an early symptom to go away. And, and you know, it just, no. It doesn't, it's not likely to come back at all. Sorry. Um, does Medicare cover this procedure? Yes. It's been around since 1991. It's been approved for, by. it was initially approved for one side and by 1995 it was approved bilaterally. So it's been common since 1995. Next question. Can a patient ever do their own programming of the unit? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Cindy question. Um, not in the beginning and not usually Parkinson's patients. Maybe patients with essential tremor who live far away um, may be able to increase their voltage slightly, but I'm very um, limited with that. I like to do the program. So, yeah, so, so in the beginning in particular, if 
if you if there's too many cooks in the kitchen, you just don't know what's what you're improving, what you're not. And in the beginning, we're trying to decrease medicines, increase electricity to get to the maximum benefit from the electricity, and then decide what we still might need to supplement with medication. So too many people doing it is um, makes it really hard to get there. But but once you're at a steady state. And Cindy, trust that you're not going to mess around with it too much. Then she can give you some ranges that you can work with, and and or sometimes we can set a couple of different settings. So say, you know, there's um, you want to play the piano and need a particularly high setting for super fine motor movement control, but then you don't need that for your activities of daily living. We can set a couple of different settings or give you a range for that kind of thing. So. So that's a partial yes. Um, next, what can you tell us about the minimally invasive laser brain surgery for PD in study now? So um, there's two things you may be talking about. One may be the focused ultrasound, which has been used for Parkinson's or for a central tremor. Um, and that, that is um, still very experimental for Parkinson's disease. And even with the central tremor, the long-term benefit is, is still uh, being sorted out, but it does seem to have short-term. Um, with any kind of laser lesioning or ultrasound lesioning, it's, it's like what I talked about in the beginning about lesioning. It's a fixed thing that is not adjustable over time. So, um, so one thing is, it is a fixed thing. It's not invasive. So for, if for some reason you can't have deep brain stimulator surgery, it gives you an alternative, but, um, but it's, not, it's not adjustable over time. So that's a bad thing. The other thing is with the subthalamic nucleus, which is the target for um, Parkinson's disease, there's a lot of evidence to show that if you lesion the subthalamic nucleus, you can get a, what's called a hemibolismus, which is a throwing motion that you can't stop doing all the time. And if you do um, both, then that's even worse. So, so lesioning in that particular part of the brain has not been a very successful treatment in the past. And that's why the stimulator, which is you know, non-destructive, and can modulate without destroying the area is, is a better option. So it's still in study phase, um, more to come on that, but, but not, I'm not too optimistic. Um, the next question though, I think I'm more optimistic about. So can you describe advancement in the newer closed loop systems? Um, yeah, so Casey Halpern of Stanford, who's a friend of ours, is um, the innovator in that. He took the NeuroPACE system, which is what is used for epilepsy, where you put the electrode in, just like we talked about, but you put the generator, you cut out part of the skull and put the generator in there. And then you also, on the surface of the brain, you put a sensing electrode. So what it does is sense activity, work through the processor, which is that programming unit, to the electrode to send electricity. And what it does is, it the concept is to try to make it closer to like your thermostat in your house, where you set a setting, and then it senses in the brain when you need to adjust and automatically adjust to different settings as your activities change. The hard part with that is finding what to sense because in the brain there's no center for rigidity that you can just get into it and say okay we're getting more rigid or center for tremor and say okay we're getting more tremor turn up the electricity it's not like that so he's looking for theta waves which is a very diffuse kind of signal and he's found it in an animal model in the mouse but it's still harder to find in humans but but if we can find the right thing to sense, then we can then we can set the right settings to automatically adjust the electricity. So, so this what to sense is the hard part with that. 
And um, just to use a diabetes example, you know, everybody's seen those, the sensing um, things people have on their skin for their glucose that can adjust, that can automatically adjust an indwelling insulin pump. So they can automatically have their insulin adjusted based on the glucose on the sensors on the skin. But we know glucose is the thing we want to regulate. So that's what makes it easy to then let the computer regulate it based on that number. In the brain, particularly with movement disorders and particularly with Parkinson's disease, there's no similar thing to glucose where we can say, okay, if it's this number, set this setting. If it's this number, set this setting. So that's what's trying to be figured out with the closed loop system. But that's, that's really the sort of holy grail at the end of that. And, and, and Casey's a really smart guy early in his career. I'm sure he's gonna get it figured out over time. Um, next question. How many people you treated have had DBS implanted for over 10 years and still receive the benefit? As the years progress and the disease progresses, and the DBS doesn't appear to control the symptoms anymore, is it dangerous to turn it off? Oh, there's a couple of them. Okay, let me start with the first one. How many people have you treated that have had the DBS for over 10 years? Um, Gosh, I'm going to guess over 500. What do you think, Cindy? Yeah, please. And um, the other thing that I will tell you is even, even when people have had it, you know, we have people now who have had it for 20 years. So even when people have had it for a long time and the disease, and some people, the disease progresses to the point where, you know, they have severe symptoms where they're wheelchair bound or something like that. But even in that situation, when we turn the stimulator off, they're much worse off. So there will be sometimes, if the disease progresses far enough, a point where it, you, it will seem like there's not clinical benefit, but there is, but it's just the symptoms have gotten so bad that it's just overriding all of the benefits. So, so like I said, even with people who've had it a really long time, progress to the point where, and some people where they end up being wheelchair bound. And, and because of that, when you turn the stimulator off, it still makes them worse. So it's still having benefit. And there are a few people who actually have been have progressed to the point where they're bedridden, but their caregivers always bring them back to get the generators changed when the generators wore out because it would make their care of their activities daily or their their wound care, their, their care of themselves, their cleaning care and everything else much easier. And it made it more comfortable for them sleeping and lying. So, so even whenever the um, symptoms seem to not be well controlled, they're still being controlled to some degree by the stimulation. It's just the disease progresses beyond what it can really effectively benefit to keep you active. Um, the next question, that same question was, as the years progress and the disease progresses, and uh, DBS doesn't appear to control the symptoms. Does it hurt to turn it off? No, it's, it's okay to turn it off. But I think, like I just said, even whenever it progresses and you think it's not helping, a lot of times it is. So that's why sometimes we will turn it off to see if they still need it. But a lot of times what happens is, you know, particularly in the people, only recently did the batteries last 15 years. So a lot of people, it's one to three years. So if they come, they'll notice when the battery wears out without even coming to see us because symptoms get worse and they come back. So, so typically we will uh, continue to stimulate throughout someone's life um, if they're still seeing benefit, no matter how progressed it gets. Then the last question is, after the initial brain mapping and programming, do you have to repeat that in-depth programming every few years as the disease progresses? And the second part of that is, do the, the leads migrate over time? First question, no. The in-depth programming is initially, and that's just incremental changes over time, because once you get the settings, then it's just sort of additive over that, because you know which contacts work and which ones don't. And then do the leads migrate? No, there is not migrate. There's a locking cap that, that screws into the skull when we put it in that holds it in place. And that pretty much um, stays in place forever. Okay, next question. What percentage of Parkinson's patients are eligible for DBS? So 
that's a good question. The, the national, the, the, the studies in our literature suggest that between 20 and 25% of all Parkinson's patients are eligible for PBS. That doesn't mean they pursue it or are interested in it. Um, but that, that at any one time, a quarter of a million people in the US would be eligible. Um, so, and, and again, it is still fairly underutilized for when it could be effective because there is the fear of brain surgery. It really is very effective. Um, next, if I am keeping up with five days a week of intense exercise, would I continue? Absolutely. This isn't meant to slow you down. This is meant to make you more active. The idea is to give you the freedom to get back to being more active. And that's what this is for. So, um, you know, you really can't go deep sea diving below 100 feet. You can't do skydiving. And if you're going to do arc welding, you need to shield the generator so it doesn't mess up the electricity. But other than that, you should do everything that you uh, like to do. Um, next one. What does your head look like after surgery? <laughs> so, uh, so typically we have people shave their head because hair in my mind is an infection risk. And if you go into all this work, you wanna really minimize that. Sometimes people wanna take that risk and we'll only shave a small area of hair where we're gonna make the incision. Um, but either way, there's typically two incisions, one on each side that's about an inch long, kind of a straight line on either side. And then there's, um, once we put the electrode locking cap in, there's a small little elevation under that incision where the cap is on each side. Um, it all, you know, when the hair grows back, it all covers over and if you're bald, it, it's not really that noticeable, but it, it's, that's what it looks like. Um, do you open the skull or just go through? So we don't, we don't turn like on, on, medical TV shows, they show cut a piece of bone out to see the brain, we don't do that. We just make a small hole in the bone about the size, a little bit bigger than a dime, just to see the covering of the brain and the part we wanna get into. But the navigation system lines us right up with where we wanna go. So, um, so we don't need a very big opening. Um, next, do you ever consider operating again on someone who had DBS years ago, since the technology has improved or is there enough benefit? If the electrode, if the benefit, if, if it seems like the electrode isn't in the optimal position where moving it to a, a, a little bit one way or the other would make a big difference, sometimes we will. But the technology, the technology is advanced, but more in the generator than in the electrode itself. So we will change out older generators from one company to generators that are maybe better from another company if it seems right. Um, so we will try some different things, but the electrodes usually the one thing we don't need to change. Um, next, what would you do if Boston Science came up with a better controller in the future? Go back in and replace it. Any information on things being researched? Example, reading brain waves and adapting on the fly. Um, so, Everybody, Boston, while well, Boston Scientific and Medtronic have both come out with new innovations um, and generators, um, which are fairly similar. The difference between Boston, which is current driven, and Medtronic, which is predominantly voltage driven, is a um, little bit of tomato, tomato, but I prefer current a little bit more, but it, it's neutral. So there isn't, so again, the electrode wouldn't be changed out, the generator would, but we wouldn't do that. There's not enough of a technological advance that we would do that out of cycle of just needing to change a change generator anyway. But when it is time to change, we, we'd talk about all the options with you. Uh, and we did talk about the closed loop, which is the, the main innovation in the future. And that, that we're hopeful for that. Um, next one. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Whiting. It is a little bit after one o'clock. We want to be sensitive to your uh, time. So if uh, we need to call this uh, quits for now, um, we're happy to do that. But if you want to hang on for a little bit longer.
I can probably do two or three more before I have to move on. Is that okay? That was perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this one, that one was, I was approved for DBS in December of 2019 at UPMC. Can these records be used to approve DBS at AGH? Um, yes, they can. Um, I also like the guy at UPMC, Jorge Martinez Gonzalez is a great doctor as well. But yeah, we're happy to um, see you and we could do that. We could use those records. Um, Next one, I've read studies that report risks of mood changes and lack of cognitive function after DBS. In your experience, has the new technology improved outcomes? That is a yes. So um, the neuropsychological testing is key to those questions you asked about cognitive and mood changes. We really um, go by that as a major determinant, but some of the newer electrodes are uh, directional, so we can um sometimes use those to point the electricity rather than circumferentially in one way or another and that does have a little bit of improvement but it's more preoperative planning with the testing rather than the technology that can give you the most um least chance of that kind of problem happening um next one are there any activities you cannot do after you have dbs swimming running uh, no, um, most, well, yeah, I mean, like I said, skydiving, um, scuba diving below 100 feet, arc welding, um, hot tubs aren't really recommended when you have the generator, um, but most of everything else you can do, the things you mentioned, definitely. And um, I, um, let me just do two or three more and then I, I gotta run, I'm sorry. Uh, here's a question. I had DBS years ago, both sides after the AFDA signed off on this. Medtronic was the only game in town. You mentioned the rechargeable. Are there any others? So there's three companies that make DBS now that are FDA approved. One is um, Medtronic, which you know, and now they have a rechargeable that's smaller as well. There is uh, St. Jude, which has a rechargeable and is smaller. And then Boston Scientific, which is smaller and has a rechargeable. Boston Scientific is current driven. Um, Medtronic ha and St. Jude are mostly voltage and convert to current. My personal feeling is current is better because it um, direct, it, it's a one-to-one -one effect, whereas voltage, the effect, the clinical effect is dependent on the density in, in the brain that it's going through, which is more of a physics explanation than you want. So. But they all have smaller generators. They all have rechargeable generators. Um, next one, I am currently working with UPMC neurologist. Oh, that one went away. Okay. Um, I couldn't read that whole question. Sorry. <laughs> um, here it is. Is there an average number of years after diagnosis of PD that DBS typically occurs? Um, the average, I'd say, would be eight to 10 but it can be earlier, it can be later because everybody's disease progresses differently. Um, how long is recovery from DBS surgery? Um, with the uh, brain surgery part, it's just basically you go home the next day, you do stay overnight, have a headache for about a week. And then a week later, we um, bring you in, put you to sleep and tunnel it and connect it. You're pretty sore, um, just the tunneling for another week. After about two weeks, you can start doing everything. And by four weeks, you can do everything. Um, and the last one, my DBS setting is close to my optic nerve. I go blind at certain settings. Um, that may be because it's in the globus pallidus area. Um, and then sometimes you can just use higher electrodes to do that, but they may well have already tried that. Um, but that's a programming thing because there's all those contacts in the electrode. And that's why you have so many. You go to one away from the nerve uh, and use different settings. So. Hopefully that's helpful for whoever's doing your programming. I think I got them all except the one I missed in there. So sorry about the one I missed. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. I think you uh, answered about 30 some questions there. So you were a great help. Um, thanks so much for participating. Folks, um, we're gonna make this recording available very shortly. And uh, Casey will send you an email when it's available. Um, 
Dr. Whiting and Cindy, thank you so much for being a part of this. And would also like to thank Boston Scientific who um, sponsored this event for us. Thank you both so much. Thank, thank you, you for the invitation. It was fun. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. We'll see y'all. Bye-bye.